Happy Wednesday. Okay, so don't forget we have exam here on Friday. I doubt that anybody's going to forget that. But please also remember how uh, we uh, sat. So let's say the first nine rows, you can sit um, um, anywhere you want, okay? First nine rows. Everything after the first nine rows, then we'll do the every other one thing again, okay? So every other one is the odd numbered seats, and the odd number starts here with number one, three, five, seven. Number one, three, five, seven. If somebody is sitting in an even numbered one past the ninth row, don't adjust for them, just they'll have to get up and move and I'll make them move. But you sit in the odd numbered seats. And then the odd numbered for over here will be one, three, five, seven. So if you come in and do that, it really helps us to uh, get things organized before we're ready to start. And if we don't get it started, then we, you won't get a full 50 minutes. So it's important that we get that uh, taken care of. Um, I posted the video for last night's review session on the schedule page. It's right here. So if you look under uh, the lecture things from last time, you'll see that right there. Um, and, oh, I didn't mean to do that. What I want to do today is start the material that will be uh, the material for the final exam. And a couple things about that. People always ask the question, number one, um, how much material is new material on the final exam and how much is old? I try to keep it roughly proportional to the coverage in the class. So roughly that means about 30% of the material on the final will be new and about 70% of the material on the exam will be old. Okay? Um, will I ask all these trick questions and blah, blah, blah? And the answer is uh, no trickier than usual. All right? Uh, that's a joke. Um, ha, ha, ha. Nobody's in a laughing mood before the exam, right? So uh, what I do with that is um, I uh, won't ask you the same questions. In a few cases, you might even see the same questions. But uh, what I instead do is pick the same topics. And so using your old exams as a study guide okay, is not a bad um, approach. It's one of the few times that old exams are there because they are relevant to what we've already had this term. Um, but just studying the answers isn't the way to go. Make sure you study the material. That's the most important thing. And of course, if you had answers that were wrong, then you should really work on why were you wrong? Why didn't you have that information uh, correctly? On the final exam, I will let you use a, a filled out note card that you fill out by hand yourselves, okay? Uh, not on the second exam, but on the, final, on the final, you will get that. And I'll warn you in advance, you have to get that note card from me. I'm very strict about that, okay? So you will have to get it from me. I will typically bring it sometime during the last week of classes, okay? And so uh, you bring your own, you're going to lose points, all right? If you don't bring one at all, you will lose points. So if you don't want to use one, that's fine, but make sure you get a card and bring it in, even if it's blank and hand it in, okay? So everybody who's here will be required to have a note card that they got from me, okay? Or they're uh, gonna lose points. Does that make sense? And so we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, that available. Okay, well what I wanna do now, as I said, is start talking about stuff for the final exam. One of the things I uh, did not uh, get to cover last time was um, how it is that we, um, um, where am I at here, DNA repair? Was to talk about how it is that we why is that? That's odd. Okay, it looks different here than it looks here. So how is it that we know mutation has happened and how is it that we determine rates of mutation? Okay, when you think about this, what you'd really like to know is I've got this compound here that I think is going to uh, uh, cause cancer because it causes mutations in DNA, or I think it might. So I'd like to know what's the rate of, mu of mutation that this compound causes compared to uh, this compound not being present at all, right? Well, there's actually a fairly simple test that's done with this. It's called the Ames test. Uh, it's named for the man, Bruce Ames, who invented the test. And it's a very simple but powerful test. So let's um, take a look at how this works. This test um, comes in a variety of forms, okay? Um, and this one shows that they're working with a bacterium that has uh, an inability uh, to grow in the absence of an amino acid. All right, it gets a little complicated. Let's imagine that we have a bacterium that has a gene that can make a color. 
Okay? So if it has the gene, it makes the color. And if it doesn't have the gene, it doesn't make the color. Right? If it has the gene and the gene is non-functional, it still won't make the color. Everybody with me? So that's our starting point. We've got a bacterium that has a gene that could make a color, but the gene that it has for doing that is non-functional. You imagine that? It just has this gene. The gene doesn't do anything, so the bacterium doesn't do anything. No color, right? Well, then we start thinking about, well, how is it non-functional? This gene that's in this bacterium has one single base that changes the protein that makes the color from being functional to being non-functional. Okay? So when I say non-functional, there's only one, and yes, this is very easy to do, by the way, there's only one base that needs to be changed in this gene that makes it functional. Everybody with me? Okay, so I got this bacterium. All the bacteria that I, I grew up with the bacterium overnight, and I've got it in this tube. And I start with something that has a completely non-functional gene. Okay? I take this mixture of bacteria that starts out with non-functional gene, and I divide it into two fractions. One fraction I treat with my compound. My compound, I, I think, might cause a mutation. The other batch gets no, nothing at all. It's the control. Okay? It's the negative control. And then what I do is I spread that out onto some plates, and I ask the following questions. Or the following question. How many bacteria that grow have color? Because that means that that one base got changed, which means that a mutation had to happen in order for that to become a functional gene. Well, in this example, we can see the, the mutation, the mutagen, the compound that caused the mutation, looks like it caused the mutation because we see a bunch of bacteria that produce color. You look down here, you say, well, how come these guys produce color? And the answer to that is because as the bumper sticker says, mutation happens. Mutation is always occurring at a low rate. That's why we have control. So we compare the number of colonies that are colored for the mutation or for the mutagen compound with the number of col colonies that are colored for the untreated. And if this on the top is greater than the one below, we have evidence that the compound that's in here causes mutation. It's very simple. This kind of analysis can be done overnight. And you get a pretty darn good measure of the likelihood of this causing a mutation. And yes, I know you'll get confused because you'll think, well, there's all kinds of other mutations that can happen, et cetera, et cetera. You don't see those. And you don't care about those. All you care about are the mutations that give color. And that's one specific base. Right? You're doing a very sensitive assay of one specific base. And yes, you can determine a lot of information from something like this. If I say that I have a mutation rate of one in a million, and I plate 10 million bacteria on here, I might expect, I might see roughly 10. Okay? I might see roughly 10 here. Whereas if I have a, mut a mutagen that causes, that changes the mutation rate to 1 in 10,000, okay, I would expect to see 100 times more or 10, or 1,000. Or, or, uh, uh, 1,000 mutations, right? Or 1,000 colonies that are red. So that's what the Ames test tells us, and it tells us in a very simple and quick fashion if a compound is a mutagen or is potentially a mutagen. There's other things we can do as well. Questions about that? Okay. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is DNA recombination. And DNA recombination is something that you probably covered in basic biology class and or genetics. Recombination basically involves swaps of pieces of chromosomes. 
And um, the most common one that we describe, and the, one, the only ones that I'll be dealing with here, what's called homologous recombination, where we have related regions of chromosomes that swap with each other. And so you can see a really good example here. Here's the paired chromosomes that we have in our body. Each pair is very similar to, or each one of the pair is similar to the other. So there are regions that have very, very strong sequence similarity. So when the replication machinery, which it is also machinery, when the replication machinery looks for homologous sequences, it finds them and says, okay, we're gonna swap you guys right here, okay? And so that's what's happened in here. We can see the, the coding by the red and the blue, what's uh, happened and how the swapping has occurred. That swapping um, is going on. It went on in the process of making you. And as a consequence of that swapping, okay, what that means is that we like to think of ourselves as the hybrid of our parents, and we are. But we're not perfect hybrid. We have sequences in us that neither of our parents have because of this. The crossing over creates new information that's swapped in that way. It's actually possible for identical twins to have differences arising from this, depending upon when the mutation happened during the development process. There are examples that are known, for example, of identical twins, okay, that have very different phenotypes because of this happening after their fertilized egg split, okay? Now, it's not common, all right, but it does happen even with identical twins. So this recombination that happens is one of the mixes and matches that happens during the process of evolution, okay? And it's given rise to new sequences that have, in some cases, given rise to important new functions. In other cases, caused some significant problems for the organisms that had them. I'm going to show you a figure that I'm not going to ask you to draw, and I'm not going to ask you to interpret. In fact, you can just kind of sit and relax, all right? It, is, it shows you a process called strand invasion. And with strand invasion, you get the idea about how homologous recombination can work, because strand invasion involves literally one strand getting in the duplex of the other and forming stable base pairs. And the only way that's going to form stable base pairs is if those sequences that's on one strand versus the other are very, very similar and can form proper base pairs with most of what the other strand had already paired with. Okay. So strand invasion is a mechanism by which um, the homologous recombination can occur. And there are other me mechanisms, but strand invasion is a very common one. An intermediate that can happen during strand invasion is something called a holiday structure. And a holiday structure is also called a cruciform, as you can see here, because of the ways that the strands can arrange themselves, forming base pair interactions. And if we look at this sequence that's invaded up here, and we take it and we sort of rearrange it into this form, we've gone from this down to this without too much effort, even though it looks like they're very different from each other, we realize that there's a couple of different ways that we can resolve this structure, okay? Where do we make the cuts and then put the pieces back, to each other, back together? So ho holiday structures can be resolved in different ways, okay, that you can see on the bottom. Again, I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but I want you to understand that the resolution of those holiday structures give rise to various alternate possible uh, recombinations that have happened, okay? And um, the, uh, the results are, of course, are what we are. So that's um, what Holiday, Holiday is the name of the person, by the way, who discovered those structures. You can actually see these structures in an electron microscope uh, in cells when homologous recombination is occurring. And that's a, more of a detailed schematic of the same thing. Okay. And I think I will not talk about the rest of that there. Okay, so that's the last of what I want to say relative to DNA repair, um, uh, uh, DNA replication repair and recombination. I want to turn our attention now to um, the process of making RNA. RNA, the process of making RNA, of course, is called transcription. And yes, I think that one of the dumbest mistakes students make is confusing what happens in transcription with what happens in translation. 
by this point in your tr academic training, there shouldn't be any confusion what's happening in there, but I will wager typically about 20% of you are going to screw up on a very easy question I'm going to give you on the final exam that will reveal whether or not, everybody's writing that down, good, okay, I'm happy if you write it down, all right, it's going to screw up on the simple difference between transcription and translation. And no, I'm not going to ask you what is the difference between transcription and translation. But you're going to reveal in your answer to me that you don't remember the difference between transcription and translation because it happens every time. And about 20% of the class will do that. That's embarrassing. Okay. So make sure you understand what's happening. And if, if the only thing you, it's like this memorizing versus internalizing thing. If the only thing you get is you say, transcription is the process of making RNA. Okay. That's not quite the same as understanding what's happening in transcription, right? So, make sure you understand that. Well, let's talk about transcription. Transcription, of course, is the making of RNA. It starts with a DNA template. And one strand is copied. One strand of a DNA duplex is copied in transcription. The enzyme that makes, does the copying is called RNA polymerase because it's making RNA, just like DNA polymerase was what the name we gave to the enzyme was, that copied and made DNA. Okay. RNA polymerases, as we will see, are different from DNA polymerases in a couple of respects. They're also very similar in other respects. Okay? I'll talk about those in just a second, but before I talk about those, I want to talk a little bit about an overview of what's called the central dogma. I'm sure you've all heard of the central dogma. The central dogma says basically that DNA makes RNA makes protein. And many of you are going to just memorize that, and that's fine internalize it, don't memorize it, okay? DNA is the template for RNA. It means RNA is complementary to one strand of DNA. And since it's complementary to one strand of DNA, it's very similar to the sequence of the other strand of DNA, the only difference being that RNA contains U instead of T. That's the only difference, okay? The process of going from DNA to RNA, as I said, is called transcription. It's shown there in red. Okay. RNA is, carries the information from the DNA to the ribosomes where that information in the RNA can be translated into making protein. That is the central dogma. Okay. This central dogma was postulated and realized very early during um, the era in which we learned um, what the structure and uh, structure of DNA was. We learned sequence later, but what the structure of DNA was. Okay? And when it was discovered, it was thought to be pretty much inviolate, meaning that DNA always went to RNA, always went to protein. But we learned by about the 1970s that there, were, there was an exception to that, and the exception to that was that there was a phenomenon known as reverse transcription in which RNA could be copied backwards into DNA. This is something that's done by some viruses as part of their life cycle. And a really good example of viruses that do that are called retroviruses. Okay. Retroviruses have typically an RNA genome and they copy that RNA into DNA as part of their life cycle. I'll show you a little bit about that uh, later. Okay. And uh, that means they have to have a special enzyme that does that. The enzyme that copies RNA and makes DNA is known as reverse transcriptase. Okay. And that's the only exception uh, to the central dogma, unless you include the fact that some RNA viruses have RNA genomes, but instead of going through a phase of DNA, they simply replicate themselves from RNA to RNA in which case we have RNA replication, and that's what's shown down here. Okay? But the central dogma is a guiding feature of our understanding about how cells work. So for the most part, we're going to go from green to red to blue. Okay. Now, in um, transcription, which is what we're going to be focused on in this uh, part of the exam, in transcription, we see the copying of DNA to make RNA and the translation of the information in RNA to make protein. We can see that happening here. 
we see uh, that we have a DNA strand up here, or a DNA duplex up here, and one of those strands has been copied. So the bottom strand has been copied to make this, because we can see the complementarity. G was with C, U was with A, G was with C, C was with G, et cetera, et cetera. And as a consequence of that complementarity, the sequence of this RNA is almost identical to the sequence of the DNA. In fact, it is identical if we simply substitute U for T. That means that we have two strands of DNA that we give names. Okay? Two strands of DNA that we give names. The strand that's copied is called the template strand because a template is something that you copy. The sequence of the complement to the template strand is called the coding strand because it has pretty much the same sequence, again with the exception of U versus T, okay, as the RNA that's made that will ultimately be made into protein. Okay. Uh, what do I want to say there? Nothing. You guys like it when I, when I have nothing to say about something. Building blocks, you've already seen them, all right? You know that they are ribonucleotides, ATP, CTP, UTP, GTP. And you know as ribonucleotides they have ribose as their sugar, which means that they have hydroxyls at positions 2 and 3. Okay. Again, triphosphates are used to make the RNA, just like the triphosphate, deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates were used to make the DNA. Transcription um, is a, a phenomenon that actually occurs somewhat differently in eukaryotic cells compared to prokaryotic cells. In both sets of cells, DNA is being copied to make RNA, and the complementarity rules are exactly the same. And another thing that is the same and that is, is that the process always, underline always, occurs in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, just like the process always occurred in DNA replication in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So what are the differences? Well, the differences are that when we look at a eukaryotic cell, we have specialized organelles that we don't have in a prokaryotic cell. A nucleus, I'm sorry, a, a eukaryotic cell has a nucleus. And the nucleus is where the DNA is. Prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus. Their DNA is just floating around in the equivalent of what is the cytoplasm. And that might not seem like it's a big deal until you realize that in a eukaryotic cell, the ribosomes where the translation occurs are in the cytoplasm. The DNA is in the nucleus, the ribosomes for translation are in the cytoplasm. The DNA is in the nucleus, that means that transcription's got to occur in the nucleus. And that RNA has got to be moved out to the cytoplasm where it can be translated. Whereas in a prokaryotic cell, you don't have that. In a prokaryotic cell, once you start transcription, the ribosomes are already floating around there. The ribosomes in a prokaryotic cell actually begin translating the messenger RNAs before transcription has even completed. That's not possible in a eukaryotic cell because they occur in different places. They can't occur at the same time. Okay, well I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so let me slow down and talk about what's on this slide. Okay. What do we say about transcription? Well, we said in DNA replication, that DNA replication always starts at an origin. Origin is where the replication starts. Okay. The place near where uh, transcription starts, and notice I said near, the place near where transcription starts has a name and it's called a promoter. So you can think of a promoter as sort of like an origin except for it's near where the um, transcription starts instead of being the place where the transcription starts. The process requires ATP, GTP, CTP, and UTP. It uses the base pairs. It requires an RNA polymerase. It only works in the 5' prime to 3', prime, and only one strand is copied. Okay? So that's reiterating things I've said before. Okay? 
Let's spend a minute talking about RNA polymerase. Okay. This is another difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Okay. Our cells have three RNA polymerases. One that works on the ribosomal RNAs, at least the large ribosomal RNAs. It's called RNA polymerase 1. We have a second one <clears throat> that makes the messenger RNAs. It's called RNA polymerase 2. And the third one that we have works on the tRNAs and a bunch of small RNAs. And it's called <clears throat> excuse me, RNA polymerase 3. You probably saw that coming, didn't you? RNA polymerase 3. E. coli only has one RNA polymerase. It does everything. E. coli's RNA polymerase has a very confusing name. It's known as RNA polymerase. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. I'm not even going to try to milk a laugh out of that one, okay? Now, RNA polymerase is like DNA. I didn't really show you much of the structure of DNA polymerase, but RNA polymerases and DNA polymerases are similar in their overall general structure. The similarity that they have is that they're both shaped like a hand. And if you can see that hand sort of outlined in that top figure that's on the uh, slide. The hand I'm showing is like what I'm showing with my hand here. It has fingers up on the top, and that's fingers up there, and it has a thumb down the bottom. Okay? And the reason that's relevant is that the DNA duplex is held in the palm of the hand. Okay? Unfortunately, this one is sort of backwards in the bottom. So on the, back, on the one on the bottom, you kind of got to look at it like that. Okay? But that's what's happening with an RNA polymerase. Okay? Um, what do I want to say? A lot of things up there have a hand structure. The only polymerase, 5' prime to 3', prime, and here's the difference with DNA polymerase. RNA polymerases do not need a primer. You already knew that because you remember primase from DNA replication. That made the primers, right? So RNA polymerases don't require a primer. DNA polymerases require a primer. Okay? Uh, one strand is copied. Most eukaryotic cells have three. Plants have five. Uh, what? Prokaryotic have, prokaryotes have one. Some viruses have their own. You might wonder why do they have their own? We'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about the importance of a control of transcription. Control of transcription. One thing I want to say, I'll spend a, a couple minutes talking about really important, and I'll mention this later, is something called the sigma factor. Okay? The sigma factor. We're going to see in a minute that RNA polymerases are multi sub I'm tripping, are multi subunit proteins. They have multiple protein subunits. And we're not going to worry about the function of most of those subunits, but one of those subunits we are. And it's called the sigma factor. The sigma factor is, a pro is, is one of the subunits that comes on and comes off of the rest of the subunits. And what it does is it helps the rest of the subunits to find the promoter. Helps the rest of the subunits to find the promoter. We only see a sigma subunit in prokaryotic cells. We don't see that in eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes have very, very complicated and elaborate systems for recognizing promoters. And I'll say just a little bit about those. I'm going to spend most of our time talking about how prokaryotes do that. And prokaryotes, by comparison, are very simple. And one of the considerations is the sigma factor, because the sigma factor is involved in that binding to the DNA and helping the RNA polymerase to get started in the transcription process. Okay. Um, what else do I want to say? Oh, yeah, alpha amanitin. Okay. Alpha amanitin is the poisonous material in death cap mushrooms. Once or twice a year, you hear about somebody who went out in the forest and they found these incredible mushrooms and they brought them home and they cooked them up and before they knew it, they were in the, um, 
emergency room waiting on a liver transplant. That's, this is how deadly this material is. Okay? If you eat alpha amanitin in death cap mushrooms, okay, you are likely going to need a liver transplant to live. And if you don't have that liver transplant in a matter of hours, you're dead. That's pretty serious. <laughs> and the reason it's serious is because this poison is exquisitely, uh, I shouldn't say the poison is, the, the RNA polymerase II that you have in your cells is exquisitely sensitive to this compound. It takes very, very little to knock out your RNA polymerase II. Well, RNA polymerase II is making those messenger RNAs, and you can't make messenger RNAs, you can't make protein, and you can't make protein, and you are dead. Okay. So this is a very important consideration. It affects eukaryotic RNA, it, it actually affects all three eukaryotic RNA polymerases, but the primary one affected is uh, polymerase II. One last thing I'll point out on this figure shows the RNA polymerase in green holding on to the duplex. And you can see the duplex has the two strands of DNA that have been separated. You can see the coding strand on, on the right, which is the one that's not being copied, and the template strand on the left, which is being copied. And you can see the RNA. And notice how this is happening. Notice that only a portion of the RNA at any given time is complementary to the uh, template strand. These guys out here, okay, made that base pairing as they were being made, but as the polymerase scooted further down the DNA, this portion just got kicked out. So we only see the RNA being paired with the DNA for a short stretch. This is what I like to think of as a tail hanging off. Okay. So the further this guy moves along, the longer the tail will get because later these things here, which are now base paired, will be sticking off and new base pairs will be forming during the synthesis of the RNA. The newest part of the RNA is on the right. The oldest part is on the left, which means that the oldest part is up here is the five prime end, and the newest part down here is the three prime end. One of their similarity to DNA replication is the strand is copied anti-parallel. So as a strand of RNA is being made in the five prime to three prime direction, the DNA strand that's being copied is being copied in the three prime to five prime direction. Okay. Another difference we see with DNA replication is that RNA polymerases in general are a lot more error prone than DNA polymerases. They don't have a proofreading function as such, although they do have some checks that I won't talk about. Okay. They make a lot more errors. And they make more errors because they aren't under the pressure that DNA polymerases are. An error that occurs in DNA and is not fixed is there forever. An error that occurs in RNA synthesis is only there as long as the RNA is. And I've already told you that RNAs have a lifetime. Cells degrade them after they don't need them for a period of time. So if there's one that's there with an error, okay, it's not going to be there forever. The error is gone. It's like I tell students that I'll get all worried about oral presentations, okay, or oral exams. How many people in the Honors College, right? How many people in the Honors College are worried about a thesis defense? Oh, yeah, right? It's the easiest kind of exam you'll ever have, okay? Because just like RNA, where it doesn't really matter, okay, everybody's like, oh, they don't believe that, right? Once those words are out there, they're gone. Okay, they're gone. Just don't say something so stupid, right, that it sticks in people's heads. That's how it hangs around. Okay? As long as you just make mistakes or whatever. Everybody makes mistakes when they talk. Goodness knows, I of all people know that. You guys have seen this on occasions, right? So, errors that happen in the RNA are like those words that you talk. Unless somebody puts it on YouTube and people point at it for years, which, my God, I hate that. Okay, all right? Unless that sort of thing happens, then you don't have to worry about it. It's, it's there and it's gone. Is that a question over here? Yeah. Does the template have a coding strand of DNA? Can they just add one to their copies and just go back? Yeah, yeah, good question. So once the uh, template and the coding strand, I've got them separated here, how and when do they come back together? It turns out that just like only a small portion of the RNA is base paired, only a small portion of the DNA has what we call this transcription bubble. It's called a transcription bubble. All right. And as this synthesis progr progresses towards the right, 
the um, base pairing starts happening behind it and uh, basically moving that bubble. So it only stays as a bubble for a short period of time during the transcription process. Okay, and I'll show you that in just a second here. Okay, so that's the nuts and bolts of RNA, okay? Um, there's the subunits, okay? There's the subunits, right? And um, there's a, a close-up of that hand that's there, and I think I'm not, I've already shown you that on the last slide, so I'm not going to go through and talk about that again. All right, well, let's talk about promoters. I've mentioned promoters. What are promoters? Promoters are sequences that are found in DNA that help to control whether or not transcription of a nearby DNA occurs. There are sequences in DNA that help to control whether a region of DNA near them is transcribed. Let's look at these sequences I have on the screen. What are they? Well, you see these letters over here. Each of these identifies some genes whose coding region where RNA would be made is close to the sequences you see for each one. So let's look at the top one. Uh, let's see here, TERP. Okay. TERP stands for tryptophan. I'll talk later about the tryptophan operon, and I'll, I'll tell you what that is later, but for, for the moment we just worry about the fact that this sequence right here is near where the transcription start site is for this gene. And that blue in each case indicates the very first nucleotide that appears in the sequence. What we see here actually is the coding strand. We're seeing the actual sequence relative to what would it be once it starts appearing. The very first, the very first base that would appear in the messenger RNA would be that A. So it's the coding strand, not the template. Okay? What's all this other crap up here? Well, if this is the first base in, that means that all these bases up here are not in. The orientation that you can see on this is in the five prime to three prime direction. Five on the left, three prime on the right. Okay. And if we look over here at something called the minus 10 sequence, we see something kind of interesting. We see that these sequences are fairly rich in AT. We also see that these sequences are similar but not identical. They're similar because they're all rich in AT. Some have a C or a G or whatever in there, and I'll explain a little bit about that. But if we took all of the sequences of all of the genes of E. coli, and we tallied up their minus 10 sequences, this is actually what we would come up with. 70% of, 77% uh, of them at this position, which would correspond to this position, have a T. 76, 60%, et etc. et cetera. These are levels of what we call conservation. Well, we know that if, C, if the bases occurred randomly, we would expect a T, we would see 25% of the time because one chance in four of a T, one chance in four of an A, one chance in four of a G, one chance in four of a C, this tells us it's not random. And it tells us that there's a preference for this sequence. This forms what we call a consensus sequence. A consensus sequence identifies a bias in the sequence that's preferentially found. So the consensus sequence here for this minus 10 is T-A-T-A-A-T. -A -T -A -A -T. Okay, everybody with me? That's the consensus sequence. Do we see anything up here that has that sequence? Well, the very top one, T-A-T-A-A-T, T-A-T-A-A-T, is identical. And if we look at the next one, T-A-T-G-A-T, -A -T -A -T, we see it's not identical. Is there any advantage to having identity? Well, let's talk about what this sequence does. This sequence is a recognition site for the sigma factor. 
The sigma factor grabs a hold of the other subunits of RNA polymerase and goes and it looks for sequences on DNA and if it finds a consensus sequence, not just a TATAAT, but if it finds a consensus sequence, it binds to it. It's through this that the cell is able to control where transcription starts. And that's really important. You've got a gene that you want to, you want to transcribe, or you need to transcribe. Okay? Having something that shows where the gene is, is really good. So this promoter is very, very important for that. Okay. Well, how come all promoters aren't the same sequence, T-A-T-A-A-T? -A -A -T? That would be the simplest of all things. There's a very good reason why they're not all identical. If they were all identical, they would all have an equal chance of sigma factor binding to them. Now, surprising as it may seem to you, cells don't want to be making all of their genes all of the time. Okay. The cell needs DNA polymerase, but the cell doesn't need a lot of DNA polymerase. We saw in the case of E. coli that with DNA polymerase 3, it got on, it stayed on almost the entire time. E. coli cells have five or six copies of DNA polymerase 3 in them. If the cell had 10,000 copies of DNA polymerase 3, most of those DNA polymerase 3s would be sitting around doing nothing most of the time. That would not be a good use of the cell's energy, right? So cells want to tune how much uh, of any given gene is being transcribed and ultimately being translated. So the first control is, is to determine how much of it is transcribed. Now, if we look at these genes, what we discover is that genes that have a, a minus 10 sequence and also a minus 35 that I'll talk about in just a second, that's close enough to the consensus sequence the closer it is to this consensus sequence in general, the more it will be transcribed. We describe that sequence as a stronger promoter. A stronger promoter will be closer to the consensus sequence, and as a result, more transcription of the, of the gene next to it will occur. That's a strong promoter. A weak promoter will still have transcription occurring next to it, but not nearly at the rate as a strong promoter. So if we look at this, we say, well, what's the one that's the most different? I would say it's probably this guy right down here. All right, TGTCAT, okay, not real strong, not real uh, important. And this is for control of the cells being able to metabolize the sugar known as arabinose. Arabinose isn't very common. Cell doesn't want to be making a ton of proteins to metabolize arabinose if it doesn't need to. Okay? So, these sequences being different actually have a function. Minus 35s work in the same way, and it turns out DNA polymerase sits down on both of these sequences. Okay? It sits down on both of these sequences. And so we can see a consensus for the minus 35. We don't see quite the same level of consensus as we saw with the minus 10, but there's some relationship there. Okay? What else do I want to say here? Uh, questions about that? I must be overly clear, or you guys are overly asleep, or you guys are overly thinking about your exam, or you're overly chatting on some social media. All right, so we're not going to, yes, question. Sigma factor binds the RNA polymerase and to the DNA. Yes. Yep. So, so the, the, as uh, you'll, I think I've got a figure. I can't recall, but it, it covers both of the sequences basically. Yeah, the, it's, that's the figure right there on your on your thing. That's showing both of them being bound. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah. How come they're all at different locations? 
We want this to be nice and precise and say it's exactly here. That may also have some consideration for a cell in terms of how efficiently it starts. You can see that most of these start with, a, with in fact, all these start with a purine, okay? Um, and most of them actually start with an A. So it may just have to do with that location. It may be more efficient in some cases for it to be one place, and that's why it starts there. Um, and but I don't have a good answer for it besides that. Okay. When we look in uh, many cells, we find that though we talk about this as being the first nucleotide, it does vary a little bit. So sometimes this will be the first. Sometimes if you have an adjacent uh, purine like here, you might see this one being the start sometimes as well. So it's not 100% as, as it is. Okay, I'm going to tell you one more thing about uh, sigma factors. Cells can make different sigma factors that recognize different uh, sequences at different times. Okay? There's a sigma factor that bacteria can make that is different than the regular sigma factor, and it's made primarily during uh, conditions known as heat shock. Heat shock is when a cell gets exposed to fairly high temperatures, might have slightly denatured proteins, and if that occurs, okay, then this heat shock sigma factor is made and it turns on a whole set of genes that aren't normally turned on but that are only active during heat shock. So sigma factors have a little bit of um, control in terms of which promoters they will actually rec recognize. Question back here. You are looking at the coding strand. But if the junk piece, doesn't it kind of capture the template strand? It does. It, t it attaches to the template strand. But I'm just simply showing you the sequence. I can, I can show you the, the template strand as well. But I just, I, the reason I show you this, uh, the, the coding strand, is it's shown in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction like the messenger RNA would read. Okay, but you're right, it's binding to the, to the template strand and copying the template strand. I don't mean to imply that's not happening, it is. Yeah, okay? So in each case, maybe this is your confusion, in each case the sequence it's copying on the template strand is a T. Or it's a C if that's a G right there. But we're looking at the sequence that would be in the messenger RNA. Okay, but it is copying the template strand, no question. Okay, good. Okay, um, why don't we turn to our song? Today's song is about transcription, and I believe it has an opening that's slightly different. So you may not see the first words pop up that pop up that, that David actually sings here. Phosphodiesters, wrong song, are the bonds of RNA. That support a ribopolymer made of G, C, U, and A. The RNA polymerase binds to a Tata box and copies from the template strand all along the way it walks. Initiation of transcription thus proceeds from the closing to open complexing in the DNA it reads. The sigma factor gets released, its work is over fast. Polymerase can then advance after this step has been passed. In elongation, the polymerizing spree moves along the way in fits and starts synthesizing five, two, three. The RNA is floppy and it dangles from one end. Oh, that's the most important thing for you to comprehend. Then termination finishes the RNAs. Thanks to protein row or hairpin forms that release polymerase. This describes transcription steps in three-part harmonies. 
Here's hoping with this melody you can learn them all with ease. There you go. Are the parts of RNA that support a ribopolymer made of GCU and A? All right. <laughs>